You need to capitalise on that opportunity while it's there and change it into something that becomes permanent. So, yes, Self-Building Custom House Building Act, I want to say I wrote it. In fact, I wrote the first version, and then Mario was sitting there at the front rewrote it um, because DCLG, although um, it loves private members, does it likes its own, it, li it likes them to conform to what it wants anyway. Uh, we, we got there, and we, it wasn't quite as strong as I would like, but then the government came along a year later and strengthened it a bit further with the Housing and Planning Act, and I'll come on to that later. So, the white paper is brilliant because it's got this word broken in it. So, the government policy is that the housing market is broken. Now think about that for a second. What a great admission. You don't tend to solve your problems until you admit you've got a problem. We know we've got a problem. Government policy is that we have a broken housing market. And that's a very, very good starting point. I have for a long time been thinking about this, why it is that the supply of housing doesn't rise to meet demand. I haven't crawled around under the tables or indeed between the, the aisles, but I bet you're all wearing shoes. We don't have a shoe shortage. We don't think we need a national shoe service to make sure that everyone has shoes, even though they're really quite important. The same is true of furniture. We have enough chairs for everyone, everyone I can see is sitting down. There's no, we don't need a help to sit service paid for by taxpayers so that we have enough chairs for everyone. So why is it with uh, housing? Well, the classic answers, and Alec gave two of the three, are uh, the reasons commonly given are finance and land, and what he didn't give, because he's directly responsible for it ministerially, of course, is planning. But those are the three you always get given. I remember asking uh, Alex Permanent Secretary, a very, very sharp sort of sound, the top of her game, and indeed the boss of the department, the sort of, I suppose you'd call her Sir Humphrey, except she's, she's a lady, so Dame, Dame Henrietta, I don't know. Anyway, <laughs> Melanie Daw was a wonderful woman. I said to her, why do you think the supply of, this was in the public council book some years ago, I said, why do you think the supply of housing doesn't rise to meet demand? And she literally looked up at the ceiling and went like this, as if the answer could only come from, from heaven. In fact, it only comes from us. We are the people who shape this world, and we have to make the changes. Actually, I don't think there's a shortage of finance. We all hear about this wall of money. There's a shortage of financeable propositions. There's certainly not a shortage of land. Only 1.2% of the land area uh, in this country is devoted to land. If you add on, it is devoted to houses. If you add on gardens, you get to 2%. Railways alone are 2.2%. If you add on everything, factories, roads, Schools, you get to about 9%, maybe 9.5%. You could double the area of housing uh, from 1.2 to 2.4% of the land area, and 97.6% of the land area of this country would still be taken up by not houses. There's more land in Surrey devoted to golf courses than houses. So that can't be the problem uh, either. And indeed, uh, one of the things that came back very clearly is now widespread consensus. There is a skills shortage in the planning uh, department. So, but there are, there are bigger questions about what planning is supposed to be for and what's happened. I think there's a bigger deficit in terms of the way the culture of planning has changed. Instead of being a great place, uh, place to go and make great places, it's become a sort of development control function uh, and, a, 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 and a says no function. So the people who are really creative, uh, some of them find it almost too much to bear. Then they get out and they earn more money to help <laughs> Uh, clients get through this extraordinary thick thicket. We have to change all of this. That's the reality. Those are, so the one on the left, the red line going downwards, that's new home completions. You start, I don't know if this thing points, that's probably not. Anyway, up at the top here, this is uh, about 1959, the red line going downwards, uh, and you'll see it's going down and down and down. That was the numbers of completions, it was about 253,000, now it's obviously much lower than that, and prices going corresponding in the opposite direction. I say to the nine year olds in Tazebrook Primary School, and what happens to the price of something if there isn't enough of it? And they all go, it goes up. And what happens to the price of something if there's too much of it? It goes down, they say. Something which I have I've had experience of struggling to explain to Bank of England economists. But it's pretty obvious to me. And I think it's obvious to all of us. So we have to do something about that. Kevin McLeod told our World Party Group three years ago, this was when I first got on the ballot for the bill. I was number four on the list. And we had a meeting with Kevin, and he said this, the consumer has been on the receiving end of a pretty poor deal. We build some of the poorest, he means by that thermal performance, um, the most expensive and smallest homes in Europe. That's not something to celebrate. I think we've got an intellectual problem. Is development good or bad? The word development is now often seen as a pejorative, and certainly the word developer is actually a swear word. <laughs> and if you think about what a, if you think about what a, a developer is, it's a person or a body or a company that makes shelter so that we all have somewhere to live. If you go on a survival course, you are taught that you will die without um, water in about three days. You will die without food in about a week or ten days. You die without shelter, potentially in a few minutes, depending on how extreme the conditions are in the, in the Arctic or in the Sahara. So development is a good word. Developers should be considered as good. I remember saying to a dinner of the Home Builders Federation 
home builders federation, the volume house builders trade point. Why aren't the question you should be asking yourselves is why aren't you loved? We don't think of the word developed as, a, as, as its obvious antonym. Developed is the, the obvious antonym, antonym of developed is undeveloped. We forget that civilization and cities are actually cognate uh, with one another. These words. They're, they're, this is off the word law of my letterhead. It's um, self-designed, so it's not exactly you know, no no money was spent with an agency on this. I'm show you. <laughs> And I've missed out. There are several words I want to get in there now. Smart, connected, and beautiful are other words, or beauty are other words I want to get in there. But they're good words, that's the point. But at the moment, a broken housing market is unable to, to meet aspirations. It's failing. A demand can't influence supply and drive products in the way that it does for shoes and chairs and all the other things that we need to have a good life. Um, and by the way, you know, to my point about uh, uh, shoes and chairs, you, if you want to build a factory uh, to make shoes or to make chairs, you still need planning permission, you still need land, you still need finance. So there is plainly something else going on. What's going on? Oh, first of all, I come to this point. Actually, we're going to change things. If we want to make development a good word, then we have to have good development. It seems to me axiomatic. One follows with the other. Yet what we've actually got is a situation where most people, most of the time, because the housing is done by a small and very large companies who build for reasons of their own, rather than to fundamentally to help others, uh, is that most people feel they've got no say over what gets built, where it gets built, how it performs, I mean, we know now how to has the cost of nothing to eat. We don't, we don't have that for 30 years, we just don't do it. What it looks like, or who has the first chance to live there. So the same people, isn't it extraordinary, in all your communities where people do, oh, we don't need more houses like in our area, and they fold their arms like this. They are the same people whose children and grandchildren can't get somewhere to live. So that the average cost of an average dwelling has gone from three and a half to four times average income for an average dwelling a generation ago to eight times average income for an average dwelling now, and that's if you're not in Hertfordshire, it's probably 10 or 12 or 13, or if you're in Oxford, where it's 17 times average income for the average dwelling. So something's gone very wrong. And in Sajid Javid's statement last week, he, he, he said, and it's worth looking up on the web, he set out a criterion based around um, average income uh, for, uh, uh, based around average prices relating to average income. And that's what's gone wrong. If we change the way we change the conversation. But at the moment, House builders have no incentive to build more houses than they can sell. That's hardly surprising. Some of the language you hear, including from, actually from government, but from all players in the sector, makes it sound as if house builders should do something that we wouldn't expect other private sector operators. We don't hector, we hector, I hector Sainsbury's and Tesco for other reasons, because they're very nasty to farmers, and I represent a lot of farmers. But of course, they do actually, I remember an article in the Congress years ago saying, Sainsbury's and Tesco are good for a poor person. They provide a very good service. We don't hector them to provide, not because they, they've got difficulties now, but that's because they're facing very tough competition. We've probably got too many supermarkets now, new people coming in. But we don't hector most private sector suppliers in order to do more than they feel is appropriate for their business. And yet, somehow, we don't tell shoe manufacturers, you know, you really must get on and make more shoes, because, you know, we need them. But it doesn't have to happen like that. The problem is this. This is the great dirty secret. Between 67% and 75% of people are unlikely to or would prefer not to buy the product of volume house builders. Alec mentioned the 14% of people wouldn't recommend um, uh, their, 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 their house to, a, to another customer. Now that was a Home Builders Federation survey. So these two numbers, the 75% number was commissioned by Maxburn from YouGov, an independent survey. The 67% number was commissioned by, guess who? The Home Builders Federation. In other words, their own trade body, their own trade body commissioned a survey which said that two thirds of their customers <coughs> would not buy their product. <laughs> now, isn't that amazing? Wouldn't you think, in those circumstances, if more than two thirds of the market wouldn't buy your product, you might think about changing it? But of course, they don't, and they don't need to, and it's actually quite risky for them to, because there's this great thicket. They, for any given site, if, if, if they're putting up 300 houses, there'll be probably 1,400 pounds of risk capital there that may just disappear if they don't get it, or may be delayed for many, many years. So they've got a model that's been honed down very, very thoroughly, with a very simple number of house designs, basically designed by accountants, not by architects, which gets simpler and simpler and cheaper and cheaper. This is why the build quality seems to go down all the time, because if you think about it, if you can remove a joist in, in a roof and save 76 pounds, it doesn't sound a huge amount of money, but if you can do that a thousand times on a thousand units, it's 76,000 pounds. If you can do that for 10 years, it's three quarters of a million pounds. If you're actually doing 10,000 units, not 1,000, which some of the large house builders are doing, then it's 7.5 million in 10 years. Who wouldn't want that on their bottom line? And that's just that one joist. Never mind the door handle, never mind the quality of the loo, never mind everything else. The great thing about people who do it for themselves is they commission the best that they can because they're going to live in it. There are lots of other reasons I'll come on to. 
why will people should be in charge, not necessarily becoming plumbers or electricians, of course not, some will, because it's very cheap, you know what to do, but mainly to give people choice. Development should be making great places to live that are well designed and well built, that means a really good housing and built environment, that are well connected in terms of transport and, of course, digital connectivity. So I've got my folk from South Norfolk over here talking to Big T. I was talking to the landowner. He said, it's amazing. We can talk to the developers. We have no influence over the speed of the broadband. And I said, that's crazy. I talked to BT. We've now got them around the table. But BT is saying, it's going to be probably a couple of thousand houses, maybe more. Uh, BT said, well, it's great. We never get the chance to get in this early before. In other words, everyone wanted the same thing, but nobody was actually talking. So we're not going to have five years of the premise for every single property. Well served in terms of schools, health, sports, and community facilities. Well run in terms of really good governance, in terms of open government, in terms of people's being able to see what's going on and have a voice. Environmentally sensitive, so green is normal, with a thriving economy, with local jobs. And we've seen everywhere from uh, the Netherlands to Docklands to Hanbury that you can actually create local jobs in situ from scratch if you, if you think about it hard enough and, and work with the right partners. Uh, communities that are active, inclusive, and safe, in other words, fair for everyone. In other words, we should separate the business of placemaking from the business of homemaking. In other words, you have a choice like that. You facilitate a market, market for service plots with public sector and private sector together enabling development of high quality uh, placement. A service plot, I'm sorry, this is one I wanted to point out. We are the outlier. This is quite normal across the world. You see the red line in the middle is the average. Countries like France and Germany and uh, Italy, they're in the middle sort of 50, 50 to 60%. Austria, little Austria is 86%. We are the ones that are not doing this because we have essentially an oligopoly. Even as recently as 1988, 60%, 66% of houses were built by small and local house builders. Now it's the other way around. Most of them are built by a small number of very large companies who, and this is a critical point, and I don't blame you them for it, will build when and only when it is sufficiently profitable for them to do so. So they eke out the supply to keep, uh, keep its guests. I was visiting a uh, a show home for Taylor Wimpy recently, and they had four uh, they had four show homes and the master plan and the usual garage and the marketing suite, and they had you know the the the, Bland, the Blandford the um, the the, uh, the Blandford the Bristol the the Hay and the Straw I can't remember their names anyway, so so I said I said oh, this is very interesting I've had a look around all of them can you show me where the Blandford will be on the plan oh that one's not available well what what, what about the Marcus or the Bristol no no that one's not available. And I said, well, are any of them available? They said, well, this one over the straw, that one's available, or the, 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 uh, the Austin, or whatever it's called. Um, and that was to create the impression of scarcity. Because, of course, if, if you could get exactly what you wanted, it's possible that their margin would, would disappear. So that's a certain spot, uh, and that's what, we, that's what we want people to do. That's what we want much more of, and when you get much more of them, they look like that. That's actually in the Netherlands. And that was under the scene uh, only a few years previously. That started in. Uh, married 2008, 2007, I think, so it's quite the same, 10 years ago. Uh, that was under, under water. Um, and they, the Dutch, and we're going to hear from my Dutch friends later, they doubled the self building sector in just eight years. It, it, they have 15,000 a year for a population of 17 million. Uh, Alec very conservatively mentioned this target of 20,000, and uh, I'm sure we'll get the hope we do. If we were now pro rata, and I should say the right to build expo, if the logo is not up there, but the right to build expo is modelled on the Dutch expert group. Uh, which, which did help accelerate their, their, their rate of, uh, of self building custom house building. If we were doing what the Dutch did, we were doing 60,000 units a year pro rata. That is a lot of extra housing. Now, to the self building custom house building, there were two bits. Alec mentioned the second one, the housing and planning act 2016. The first one, my private bonus bill, which became the self building custom house building act 2015, uh, essentially says this. It's very simple, and some of you will know this because you've got, already got the register. You must either have, if you're a local authority, a relevant authority, uh, a register which keeps a list of individuals and associations of individuals who want to get a piece of uh, land to get a service plot to build a house. An association of individuals could be anybody. It could be a group of friends. Uh, it could be the uh, governors of the school. Uh, it could be um, the directors of social services. So, for example, if you've got um, a problem recruiting senior social work managers with 20 years' experience of leading social work teams, which we do in Norfolk, we get plenty of young social workers. We've got a new social work school. But people with 20 years' experience, like gold dust. Uh, if you're a county, it won't apply to every authority, but lots of the local authorities have that. If you could say to recruits, come and be a senior manager in our social services team, and we will give you the chance to build the house of your dreams and we'll rent it to you, and then on a loyalty package which will calibrate, you are having the chance of future uh, opportunities to buy that house, the one that you design. The governors of the school could say in a difficult to fill subject, 
when we can't get enough physics teachers or enough maths teachers, come to our school and we'll get you the opportunity working with the county or working with the local authority to get a service bottle loan which will help you design the house you want, we'll rent it to you. You're a history teacher, you'll probably want a library in your house. If you're an arts and crafts teacher, perhaps you'll want a workshop in your house. Um, you don't have to buy it, we'll rent it to you. You can imagine how much of a recruitment incentive that would be to get people uh, in the places where we, we need them. Oh, by the way, um, uh, for, on the subject of group self, because this is so important in so many different ways, there's a television journalist here called Alex Hocking. Is he around? Can he stand up, please? So if any of you are interested, that's Alex there at the back. If any of you is interested in doing something with group self build space, then please talk to Alex um, afterwards. And of course, it's not just social services and governance of schools. If you are a probation officer, uh, or if you are uh, the Royal British Legion or Health for Heroes, you're working with veterans, um, we can help. So we know from Stella Clark of the Community self build Agency in Bristol, she's actually helping veterans who uh, have sometimes, when they get outside the discipline of the military environment, they, they fall off the rails, helping them get back on the rails and get a place of their own. Guess what happens to prisoners when they come out of prison and get the chance to build their own house? Do you think the recidivism rate falls? It falls through the floor. It goes from 60 or 70 percent to about 5 percent. So we can we can do this for ex-offenders as well. The other thing is communities are very often made of the people who do the stuff who get on the parish council who work hard, and the people who build their own homes tend to stay longer and get more involved in their communities. They are doers. They are community builders, community shapers. So there are lots of things. Um, where the, the phrase association of individuals, group of individuals, um, applies. And I'll come on to another point, because this is, I need to say this, this is tenure neutral. You don't necessarily have to have the money to do it. There's no reason why people can't work with not just community land trusts, but with the housing associations or housing cooperatives to do this stuff for people who are homeless and on a limited uh, income. That's what we've seen in the Netherlands. So the Housing Planning Act of 2016 takes it a little bit further. I can't see that, so I'm, I'm sure you won't be able to. Uh, basically what it says is that not only must you keep uh, I register, as in my self bill, uh, my, my, my original private members bill. But also, you must then, the key phrases are, here we go, I can see it, at the bottom one, the demand, you must you must keep, so section two at the top in red, an authority to which the section applies must, must give suitable permission, a uh, suitable development permission in respect of enough service spots to meet the demand. And the answer to the question, what's the demand, is, of course, the register. That's what the list at the bottom uh, talks about. Fundamentally, it's about creating an ecosystem in which there's lots of choice. So that is a picture of Next in my constituency. Why have I put it up? Because I was talking to the construction director when I went to the launch and asked him what about the heating system. He said, we don't really have a heating system. We, the problem with this building is thermal gain. Um, not only do they pay for the whole thing within two years, that's their business model, which is pretty stunning, but um, it costs nothing to heat. The problem, they've got vents at the top so they can let the heat out. He said, we've got a backup system, but we never use it. With the, the quality of the build in this place and the, uh, the, uh, the, the lights and the heating and the, 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 the tills and the people, that we have more than enough heat in this place and, and we keep it. Of course, so next, as a client, they wouldn't go to a construction firm that wasn't able to build something like that to that spec. They just say, well, if you can't do it the way we want, you, you, you won't get our business. That's not the position of your average person going to a Taylor Wimpy or a Persimmon or a, a, some other volume house builder. It's very much sort of, you don't have a lot of choice. That's why I put that word up there. You've got to create the choice, but it means something else as well. So this is in Potsdam. Seven single mums built this. I mean, they commissioned it, and they rent it as an affordable rent. They chose what they wanted, and they built it. And I encourage any of you, Naxpen has done trips to the Netherlands and indeed to Berlin, and there are some amazing exemplars there um, of, of what can happen. Uh, this one is in Mockenkeets. This is also in Berlin. This is over 400 homes in a big block. So the local uh, community, many of them went to the local council, the Berlin Senate, the local authority for the city of Berlin, and said, we would like to build a block of flats. We want a school in the middle of the garden. And the social glue which holds them together is that they've all got children with special needs. So they wanted a school for their kids with a series of apartments around it. And that's what they got, because the Berlin Senate said, how can we help you? Uh, this, oh, beauty, well, that's the other criteria. I, I personally think the two things we've got to have every day are beauty and choice. And uh, you'll know that Prince Charles has his bimby, Gucci in my backyard campaign. I reckon the reason why people would keep their arms for this is because they know what's coming. They know it'll be ugly. They know it'll be the same in Newcastle as it is in Taunton, as it is in, in Norwich or Exeter or wherever else. And that's what we have to change. This is in the Netherlands, these are all self-built. 
Um, look at the roof there in the middle, look at it closely. That entire roof is photovoltaic cells. So it's not just a little patch on thing. You can, of course, now get roof tiles that are made if you go to the Expo at uh, the National Exhibition Centre or elsewhere, or Grand Designs Live, or Timber Expo. You, you often see these, these things. Um, oh, yes, this is the big yard in Berlin. I love this. So there are uh, 45 properties, and they're built around a common garden. Instead of little fences, and not everybody, it wouldn't be for everybody, but this is 1,500 square metres of one garden designed in landscape like that. And this is looking, this is the inward side. The outward side looks like that, and that's from above, of course. I mean, it's not really seen the screen. But um, the, um, the, the inward bit, if my computer will wake up, I'll be able to go backwards. Uh, it doesn't like it, is it? I'm ready to go page up. Oh, no. <laughs> it really has freaked out. Uh, uh, right, we're going to get there. But what I was going to say is, so you can imagine what happens. No, don't worry, I'll, I'll, I'll get there. Um, you can imagine what happens when you. Um, uh, you're going to see all my slides in the wrong order. What about if I can control them right there? Yes. 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 So what, what happens, of course, is that because they um, uh, they're all common, all the kids play with each other all the time, and they go into each other's houses and they give each other's kids supper. And it's a real. Uh, I think it was Winston Churchill who said first we. First we design our buildings, and then they, 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 they then shape. First we shape our buildings, and then they shape us. But it's absolutely true. Um, now you're, you're going to get my you, you need all of this twice because it's very important. <laughs> <laughs> so remember about the shoes and the chest. I'm going to go through this very quickly, particularly because I don't want to labour it with the planning thing. Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, so here's these are so, these. But um, so what? So what happens if you have a communal space like that? Is it alters people's behaviour? they start to behave uh, differently. And that's, of course, what making great places ought to be about. And when people join planning departments, they go to study at the at college, they become a fellow or a member of the Royal Institute of Town Planning, they think they're going to be involved in making great places in, in a holistic way that takes account of the needs of a whole community, including those who've got money, including those who don't, to making sure that... Every so if you go to Poundbury, you look at the social housing, you can't tell by looking at it which bits of the social housing. When you see them, you think, oh, I'd love to be the one there. You really would. And it's, if you haven't been to Paris, I strongly suggest that you, you take the time uh, to do it because it, it, it's really quite challenging. So here we are, back to beauty, back to uh, the big yard. Here we go, the big yard there. I'm not going to press it backwards ever again. Um, <laughs> and these were for private purchase. These are the centre of Berlin. They're less than 300,000 each. Really extraordinary. So these are just a few photographs, and I'm going to can wrap up and... and um, uh, and we'll do Q&A and so on. So these are the Netherlands, and that's a whole street. The thing about them is that every single one is different. Every single one is different. Um, let's take them from the other end. Um, th these are, this is in a different street. You can see there's a red one, there's a yellow one. Uh, there's one that looks like a pyramid, there's a blue one. Uh, this one is sort of a leather metal theme being channeled by This one wants you to know who lives at number seven. <laughs> this one is... Uh, this one has no windows. This is fantastic. Everyone, tourists go to Almero in the Netherlands and look at this, and we've been inside of that. And it has loads of light coming. It's only by a film director designed it himself. This one is an upside down boat, which is absolutely superb. Um, this one, the windows, he decided he didn't like straight windows. <laughs> um, and if you, want, if you want something more conventional, then you can have it. These are very conventional, but of course, they're to Passive House or Code 6, as we call it, very, very near. Uh, very high thermal force. These would cost nothing to heat, and these are very, very what we think of as conventional modern. And you can even have thatch. These are brand new as well. Um, this one, ditto, and that one, believe it or not, I'm not moving backwards, but that's bang opposite the previous one. And there are one or two more points I want to make, especially since Alec is here. <laughs> Government support is very well. Thank you, Alec. Progress monitoring is vital. You can't take your foot off the pedal. One of the things that we think, I mean, you did say, uh, which is great because you said it on the record, that. Uh, not enough consumers are aware of the fact that these registers exist. We have now, you quoted the 18,000 number, we think the next round of FOIs will be at the end of next month. We think it's probably pushing 25,000. We don't, we don't have an evidence number for that, but it's a significant amount. It's going up a lot, and that's just in the last 18 months or so since the Act became law, without any push, without any advertising. We know that 1 million people, well, we know 53% of the adult population would like to do this at some point in their lives. We know there are 1 million people like to do it, this is an Ipsos Mori number, at some point in the next 12 months. But actually only about 10 to 15,000 do. Imagine if it was easy to get a service plot of land and again commission somebody to build a house as it is to go to a Vauxhall dealership or a Ford dealership and buy a motor car. If it were that easy, more people would be doing it. So I think one thing we're going to have to look at, and 
uh, uh, right to build task force, hopefully with government and the local authorities, is some form of industry government campaign to really get uh, focused around this, make sure everyone is aware of it. Government spends hundreds of millions of pounds on advertising, some of it for very good reasons, to do with making sure that um, we live longer and uh, the NHS has even greater cost than it does now, but you know what I mean. A lot of money gets spent by government on advertising, and this is something I think government does need to look at. We have help to, we don't have help to sit, but we do have help to buy. There are a whole um, retinue, panoply of different schemes uh, help equity, help to get an equity loan, all kinds of government schemes involving money. What we don't have, so we don't actually have an even playing field at the moment, is help to build. And I'm, I'm already, I've already nobbled uh, Philip Hammond, the Chancellor, and asked for a meeting with him to discuss that very point, but I'm sure we will want to do it in conjunction with the DCLG uh, colleagues. We're going to have a round table. Um, I haven't got it confirmed yet, but I'm hoping that we'll be able to do it in number 10. And if we do, we'd very much like you uh, to come. And then this afternoon, we're going to have uh, uh, a discussion group for cancer starting at 1.30 uh, after lunch. And with that, uh, any questions? Thank you.